A few days ago, an official of the American government concluded his address with the statement, we can and will remain masters of our own fate. This expression, masters of our fate, is taken from the poem entitled Invictus, which means undefeated. It comes from the pen of a British author, William Henley, whose lines have become favorites among atheists and agnostics. It boasts, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. He goes on to challenge, my head is bloody but unbowed, and he concludes, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. All this sounds brave on paper, but when death took Henley's six-year-old daughter, Margaret, he was heartbroken and began to realize that he was not the master of his fate. When he died, his bravado had disappeared. We are not the masters of our fate, individually or as a nation. How can men boast that they control their own destiny when a virus, invisible even under powerful microscopes, called hepatitis, can lay low tens of thousands of Americans this winter? How can our country insist that we, with our military might, our tremendous wealth, and our foreign alliances are the masters of our own fate when history testifies that God shaped this nation's course? As we are already into the new year, we are beginning to realize that this is going to be a year of decision. The balance of power in the United Nations has shifted to the Afro-Asian countries. No longer is the United Nations a Western-dominated organization. In Asia, Africa, and Europe, the communist pressure is on, moving toward a climactic decision. China's population this year may go over the billion mark, and internal pressures will make this tremendous giant move to expand her borders. In a few days, we begin our tour of South America. During the past few days, I've been reading everything I could get on Latin America. There is no doubt that the penetration of Castro's communist agents is very deep in almost every country. In addition, the world continues to wrestle with poverty, disease, and ignorance as the population continues to explode. America is caught up in a stream of history that is beyond her ability to control. There's only one power available to change the course of history, and that is the power of prayer prayed by God-fearing, Christ-believing men. Our nation was founded by men who believed in prayer. Benjamin Franklin said at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, when our government was in the process of being formed, I've lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire cannot rise without his aid. We would paraphrase the words of Benjamin Franklin today and say, it is probable that a nation cannot keep her freedom without the aid of Almighty God. Our first president, George Washington, led his armies to victory, but not until first he had taken time alone to invoke God's blessings upon their cause. Down through our history, our nation's leaders have carried their plans and hopes to God in prayer. Yet today, we have come to a place where we regard prayer in our national life simply as a formality. We have no sense of coming to grips with God, but simply the continuation of a venerated tradition. If this nation was born in a meeting of prayer and some of its most important decisions were made only after careful prayer to God, how can we go on unless there's a renewed emphasis on prayer today? One of the reasons the United Nations has become so ineffective in handling world situations is because there's no prayer or recognition of God. At the first meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco, there was no prayer made to God for guidance and blessing. We were afraid that the atheistic communist would not like it, so we bowed in deference to them. I predict that unless these men finally in their desperation turn to God in prayer, their best plans will fail as the plans of those building the Tower of Babel. Unless we as a nation turn to God, we cannot have any hope for the blessings from heaven. There are thousands of people that pray, but they pray only when they're in times of great stress, danger, and uncertainty. I've been in airplanes where the motor conked out and people started praying. We've flown through bad thunderstorms when people who never thought to pray before were praying all around us. It seems to be instinctive in man to pray in times of trouble. Christ commanded his followers to pray, both by the example he set in praying and in his teaching. 
So fervent and direct were his prayers that once when he had finished praying, his followers turned to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. On another occasion, he taught them to pray by way of illustration through a parable. He taught of the widow and the unjust judge who rendered a favorable decision to the widow, not because he feared her, but because of her perseverance. So Jesus said that men ought always to pray. From one end of the Bible to the other, there are stories of those whose prayers have been answered, men who turned the tide of history by prayer, men who fervently prayed and God answered. Abraham prayed. And as long as he prayed, God would not destroy the city of Sodom where Abraham's nephew Lot was living. If Americans, instead of building fallout shelters, would spend their time in fervent praying to God, we might never need these fallout shelters. Even though America is just as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah ever was, and we are deserving of the judgment of God, yet God would spare us if we were earnestly praying with hearts that had been cleansed and washed by the blood of Christ. Hezekiah prayed when his city was threatened by the invading armies of the Assyrians under the leadership of Sennacherib. And the entire army of Sennacherib was destroyed and the nation spared for another generation because the king prayed. I do not believe that the problems of our world will ever be settled until our national leaders bow their knees in prayer. If only our leaders would discover the strength and reliance upon God, we could soon see the solution to the grave problems that face the world. How wonderful it would be if the Vice President of the United States would ask the Senate to get on its knees before God at the beginning of this session. What a tremendous change there would be in all the affairs of government. Elijah prayed and God sent fire from heaven to consume the offering of the root altar he had built in the presence of God's enemies. Elisha prayed and the son of the Shumanite woman was raised from the dead. Daniel prayed, and the secret of God was made known to him to the saving of his companions and the changing of the course of history. Jesus prayed at the door of the tomb of Lazarus, and the one who had been dead for four days came forth. The thief prayed, and Jesus assured him that this day he would be with him in paradise. Paul prayed, and hundreds of churches were born in Asia Minor and Europe. Peter prayed, and Dorcas was raised to life to have added years of service for Jesus Christ. John Knox prayed, and Queen Mary said that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than she feared all the armies of Scotland. John Wesley prayed, and revival came to England, sparing her the horrors of the French Revolution. Jonathan Edwards prayed, and revival came to Northampton, where more than 50,000 people joined the churches. History has been changed time after time because of prayer. I tell you, history could be altered and changed again if people went to their knees in believing prayer. What a glorious thing it would be if millions of Americans would avail themselves of the greatest privilege this side of heaven. Jesus Christ died to make this communion and communication with the Father possible. He told us of the joy in heaven when one sinner turns from sin to God and from his heart breathes a simple prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. In this modern age in which we live, we've learned to harness the power of the atom, but very few of us have learned how to fully develop the power of prayer. We have not yet learned that a man is more powerful on his knees than behind the most powerful weapons we have ever developed. We have not learned that a nation is more powerful when it unites in earnest prayer to God than when its resources are channeled into defensive weapons. We have not discovered that the answer to our problems can be through contact with God. When the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Lord, teach us to pray, the Savior answered their request by giving them his model petition, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, however, was only the beginning of his sacred instruction. In scores of passages, Christ offered further guidance, and because he practiced what he preached, his whole life was a series of lessons on prevailing prayer. One of the most amazing things in all the scriptures is how much time Jesus took out for prayer. He only had three years of public ministry, yet Jesus was never in so big a rush. But what he had time to spend hours in prayer. He prayed before every difficult task confronting him. He prayed with regularity. Not a day began or closed on which he did not unfold his soul before his Father. How quickly and carelessly, by contrast, we pray. Snatches of memorized verses, hastily spoken in the morning. Then goodbye, God, for the rest of the day until a few closing petitions at night. This is not the prayer program that Jesus outlined. Jesus pleaded long and repeatedly. 
It is recorded that he spent entire nights in fervent appeal. How little perseverance and persistence and pleading we show. The other day, the newspapers told of a man in Washington who spent 17 years securing favorable action on a claim of $81,000 against the government. Yet many people will not pray 17 minutes for the welfare of their own immortal souls or the salvation of a people. The scripture says, pray without ceasing. This should be the motto of every true follower of Jesus Christ. Never stop praying, no matter how dark and hopeless your case may seem. A few months ago, a woman wrote me and said that she had pleaded for 10 years for the conversion of her husband, but that he was more hardened than ever. I wrote her back and said, continue to plead. Just the other day, she wrote and said, her husband was gloriously and miraculously converted in the 11th year of her praying. Suppose she had stopped after only 10 years. Our Lord frequently prayed alone, separating himself from every earthly distraction. You Christians that are listening to my voice, select a room or a corner in your home or in your yard where you alone can regularly and privately meet God. That quiet, secluded soul to God praying in which you come to the mercy seat for divine blessing on your home and country can be the nation's strongest secret weapon. Its most powerful spiritual defense can be prayer. A teenager wrote me the other day and asked, why don't more churches kneel when they pray? I've often wondered that myself. While we can speak to our Father in any posture, lying on a sick bed, walking to work, sitting in an automobile, certainly the bended knee shows humility, subjection, and reverence. Mighty leaders have not hesitated to bow down before God. It was reported that one could always tell General Washington when he went to Congress in Philadelphia because he always knelt in prayer. As we continue to watch the prayer life of Jesus, we notice the earnestness with which he prayed. The New Testament records that he cried out with a loud voice that in the intensity of his supplication, he fell headlong on the damp ground in the garden and that he pleaded until his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood. Too often we use petty little petitions, oratorical exercises, the words of others rather than the cries of our inmost being. Too often when we go to prayer, our thoughts begin to roam. We insult God by speaking to him with our lips while our heart is far from him. Suppose you were talking to the Queen of England as it has been my privilege to do on several occasions. You would not let your thoughts wander for one moment. You would be intensely interested in everything she said. How then dare we treat the King of Kings with disrespect and disdain? There are so many lessons that Jesus taught us in prayer that I cannot possibly cover them in these few minutes. Certainly one that we should remember during these days of prejudice, hate and lust in the world is this. Jesus teaches us for whom we are to intercede. How startling his instruction and his example. He tells us to pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. In other words, he says, pray for your enemies. We are to plead for our enemies, asking God to lead them to Christ and for his sake to forgive them. In the first words Jesus uttered from the cross after the heavy nails had been hammered through the quivering flesh of his hands and feet, he began to intercede for his crucifiers, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How many of us have ever spent time praying for our enemies, even the communists? Yes, we are to pray for the communists, that they may be turned from the evil of their ways and recognize that God is the Lord of history. We are also told in Scripture to pray for the conversion of sinners. I listened to a discussion of religious leaders recently on how to communicate the gospel. Not once did I hear them mention prayer. And yet I know scores of churches that win many converts each year by prayer alone. If there's a person of your acquaintance that needs Christ in his life, then start praying for them. You will be amazed at how God will begin to work. There is one more lesson that Jesus would teach us, and that is the victorious assurance that God answers every true petition. Skeptics may question it, humanists may deny it, and intellectuals ridicule it, Yet here is Christ's own promise. Ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Trust that promise with all your soul today. Build your hope for time and eternity on that divine fact. God answers prayer. Your Father possesses everything. He can supply all your wants according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The vaunted might of dictators, the glory of empires, are but passing gestures to him. He can defeat each enemy of your soul and defend you from every danger. With God, 
nothing shall be impossible. No task is too arduous, no problem too difficult, no burden too heavy for his love. The future with its fears and uncertainties is fully revealed to him. He understands how much affliction and sorrow you need to help purify and preserve your soul for eternity. Turn to him and you can say with Job, he knoweth the way I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. No, ladies and gentlemen, we are not the masters of our own souls. Do not put your will above God's will. Do not insist on your way. Do not dictate to God. Do not expect an immediate answer in the way, the place, and the manner that you're demanding. Rather learn the difficult lesson of praying as the sinless Son of God himself prayed, not my will but thine be done. There are many of you today that pray in times of danger, but you have never come to know Jesus Christ. And the scripture says the one mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ. You must know him and you must pray in his name. Your prayers must be directed according to the will of God. Many of you do not know how to pray. Why don't you start today by saying, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Let him forgive the past sins. Transform your life and make you a new person. He can do it today in answer to the simplest prayer. Shall we pray? Our Father, we come to thee as little children today, asking thee to change our lives and to teach us to pray. We know so little about prayer. Lord, teach us, we pray thee, to pray like Jesus and to spend the time he spent in beseeching, fervent praying. For we ask it in his name. Amen.